Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. Hello, my listeners. I've got a fantastic interview for you this week. My guest is Megan O'Leary. Megan is a 2016 Olympian and five-time national team member with the United States rowing team. Megan was a two-sport athlete at the University of Virginia and competed in volleyball and softball. She did not pick up an oar until she was 26 years old. In this interview, Megan shares her journey from being a novice at 26 and just six short years later, competing at the Rio Olympic Games. She also provides some great insight into her training, detailing what she does for strength and conditioning, mindset and visualization, diet, and breath work. This interview will be published just as Megan has finished competing at the 2017 World Rowing Championships in Sarasota, Florida. I'll be sure to include a link in the show notes so you can watch the final. Without further ado, let's roll to episode 91 with Megan O'Leary. I'm very excited uh, to welcome Megan O'Leary, 2016 Rio Olympian and current women's rowing national team member to the Leo Training Podcast. Megan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your work and training schedule in between sessions to come on to the show. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, we got some great topics down to discuss. Uh, we're going to talk training. We're going to talk about your personal journey. Um, so with that, you know, I'll turn the mic over to you and um, kind of sit back and, and hear uh, your roots uh, in the sport of rowing. Sure. You know, I, when, I, when people ask, like, oh, where did you row in college? I kind of laugh and I say, well, I didn't. Um, and it is a especially now with, with all the opportunities for, you know, especially women rowing is so big in college. Um, I'm a little bit of a, an outlier in terms of my, you know, how I came into the sport, but I played volleyball and softball as a two sport athlete at the university of Virginia, um, which is a huge, you know, rowing powerhouse, Kevin Sauer. And, you know, I have to tell the story. He, he definitely picked me out. (laughs) He, uh, (laughs) he, he did ask, he said, you know, you should come row. Um, I remember, you know, we, we had similar like weight, like our weights times were the same time as, as rowing. And so, and I think he could just, you know, I'm tall and he could probably identify that I was a little bit of a workhorse. And so he, he definitely, he planted the seed. He put the bug in, bug in my ear. And, um, cause I didn't know what rowing was. I grew up in, I kind of moved around a lot as a kid, but grew up mostly in the South and Midwest. Um, Louisiana is home for me and rowing's not huge down there. It's there, but it's not big. So I didn't know much about the sport, um, you know, and then flash forward. So I graduated. I didn't, you know, I didn't pick an oar up in college, but I think it piqued my interest. Flash forward to, I, I got a job with ESPN. I had moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, lived there for a year and a half and started to get into CrossFit a little bit. So I was on the ERG, I was on the rowing machine, uh, and pulling decent numbers. And then I moved to Connecticut and, you know, I, I was in New England. I was like, I want to, you know, do something different than I called it beer league softball. So a slow pitch softball. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I Googled, I just Googled rowing and uh, I was living in West Hartford, but Hartford, Connecticut is right there on the Connecticut river. And, um, a couple, there's a, there's a boathouse, there's a boat club right there, riverfront recapture. And they were having, you know, learn to row basically sessions the summer of 2010. And I, I signed up. I was like, well, let's do this. Why not? <laughs> never having been in a boat, never having pulled on an oar. Um, I showed up, I was wearing the wrong clothes. I, you know, I, I was it, pun intent, like I was a fish out of water, but it was, <laughs> it was really, it was really invigorating because being such a, you know, I'm in, i I'm, I'm lucky that I was a natural athlete growing up and, you know, I have brothers and so they pushed me to be even, you know, more athletic. My parents are athletic, but to show up and be in an environment where I felt so uncomfortable, I actually, it didn't turn me away. It actually turned me on. I was like, wow, like I, this is something new. This is something different. And there's a part of me that has no idea how to do this. And I love that. 
Um, and so that was my introduction into, introduction into rowing. I was the youngest one there. Most of the, the, my fellow, you know, learn to row classmates were kind of, uh, you know, late for early, or late forties, early fifties women and, and men kind of just doing this recreationally. And, uh, the coach luckily kind of picked me out and said, what's your deal? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, I, after a couple of days, I was like, I love this. Like how, how can I do this more competitively? And it kind of just took off from there. Um, you know, got, got pulled into, to training with the kind of the master's team, which is still recreational rowing, but you know, a step above and, um, the coach found a, another elite athlete training in the area, uh, Brian Tryon, who was a lightweight, uh, men's rower. And he was just training down the river at the Trinity Boathouse, Trinity College. And, so, you know, I show up, this was a couple months later after my learn to row and he expected me to be gone after a couple weeks. He didn't think I'd last. And I was just like that little gnat. Like I kept showing up every morning and finally he took me seriously. And so I had a training partner and that really helped me just, you know, kind of my introduction in sport and right, you know, flash forward six years later, I was at the line of the Olympic final. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and I'm sure uh, millions of uh, strokes in between there. <laughs> Absolutely. There's, there's a lot. I mean, I could go on and on and I, I laugh thinking about it um, and kind of reliving those experiences. But, you know, just the, the sport brought me to, you know, so many people. And I mean, the biggest lesson I learned was no question is dumb, especially if you don't know anything. And so I, I had to be unafraid to ask questions and to put myself in those situations where, yeah, I might be embarrassed, but I got to find out the answer. So I have to ask all the questions. And then just, yeah, just putting myself out there despite feeling awkward and uncomfortable. Um, and I think that's what helped kind of take me, you know, the quick ascent to kind of take me to where I wanted to get because I didn't get in my own way. Right. Yeah. And that's, that almost sounds like to me, that almost sounds like an advantage that, that you, um, didn't have any prior rowing experience because, you know, you didn't develop any bad technical habits, you know, you were kind of like a, a blank canvas. So like, you know, you were, uh, you know, athletically much more mature. You had done previous sports. So you're able to kind of really, uh, pick up the sport and go. So kind of what you looking back over those six years, you know, picking up the oar one day and then six years later, you're in the Olympic final. Like what, what is that like kind of going through that process of just, refining the rowing stroke and, you know, adding more mileage, more intensity, you know, what was that experience like? Yeah. I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I do. I think it was an advantage to come in at a level where I was a blank canvas that, you know, there are many different techniques, um, in college, you know, junior college rowing, and most of it's sweep here in the U S the emphasis is on sweep rowing. Um, and I'm a, I'm what I like to call a pure scholar. I have not done a lot of sweep. But I think in terms of becoming a specialist um, and, you know, sculling and the women's double, that's the only boat that I've been in a national team on, but it is a, it's a unique boat. Um, I was able to cater my skill set uh, more rapidly toward that mm -hmm. without the prior, yeah, like kind of weird, you know, either weird habits or kind of having, just having to go from, you know, well, this is how we swept it at UVA versus this is how we swept at the U23 program. So there's just like, there are different, different technical approaches. And I think coming in at a place where I was my, how I learned my, you know, my first strokes were how I, you know, eventually needed to row, um, at a very high level. So it was, it was also that sink or swim, like you got to get here or you're never going to get there. And so that just, not, I didn't need to create that that pressure on myself, but it was also, um, an understanding of, it forced me to study. Um, it forced me to listen and it forced me to just focus at such a, you know, kind of such a, a more acute and, and sharper angle, um, that I think that I was able to make the changes necessary, um, to get, you know, knowing that I got to I got it. This is, this is what I have to do. <laughs> so I got to figure out how to get there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers the question. And plus, like, I think not having the prior, if you've done something before, you're always going to have that model, right? You're always going to have that preconceived, well, this is how I did it before. So this is, I'm going to do a version of this. But if you've never done something, and then, you know, one of the best people shows you how to do it, or you see it at a very high level, that's your model. 
And so you're not going to de- you're going to deviate obviously slightly from that, but if that's your aspiration, you're going to get much closer. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um how does your how did you kind of draw on your experience as a two sport athlete, you know, and how did those sports, you know, how are they completely different from rowing? Yeah, well, you know, the distances, so when you <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're thinking about if you could get more opposite. Like I wasn't even a like. Well, I played. So- I love soccer, but they they run miles right over the course of 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, softball. You're literally running. You're like 60 feet turn left. Like <laughs> you are not yeah, running very right. far. Volleyball. It's three feet, and you're just jumping and diving. Uh, so it's very different in terms of the fitness um, and even the development. So, you know, my, the muscular development. And so I did have to change my body in a way, um, to, you know, to acclimate or, or kind of like, it was just an adjustment in training, but I always loved running and going long distances. I think that was something that was always just a part of my core. Um, so that was easy. Like I didn't mind the 90 minute sessions. Um, I think that what helped with my, you know, growing up with, technical so I was also basketball player you know volleyball softball um they're very they're very technical right so you have to how you hold the bat and how you come through um has has a very big impact on how you're going to connect so how you're gripping the oars and how you're positioning your shoulder um and you know are you engaging your lats is going to have such a huge impact on how you're taking the water so the understanding of you know, if you're hitting something this big, you have to make little adjustments. Mm -hmm. Um, and if how you're striking the water is, is made in a little adjustment. And I I think that appreciation for, you know, the minutia of the, you know, the technicality of the sport, um, translates very well. Um, you know, softball, volleyball, same thing. I was a, where positionally I was a right side and middle hitter. And there's a lot of, you know, angles and understanding of how to move your body and how you, you know, to get the result you need to get, like what are backing it up? What are the six steps to get there? Um, And that's the same thing as the stroke. It's not, you know, I think so many people see rowing and they're like, wow, it just looks so effortless and it's beautiful and it just looks really easy. I'm like, well, they're doing it correctly. It's actually very, you know, it's very difficult. And, you know, there's a lot of little things going into that end product. And I think that, um, you know, coming from a technical, very, you know, technical sports with, you know, the little, little things are so important, really helped me to, especially with sculling, um, understanding, you know, the movement of my body to get, you know, to, to tell it and get it to do what I needed it to do definitely helped me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting that just listening to your response there, all those sports that you played, um, uh, basketball, softball, volleyball, uh, soccer, there's a huge timing component you know, lining up like, you know, softball, connecting the bat to the ball, soccer, kicking the ball, volleyball, jumping up, timing it, making sure you're making contact to get that ball to land to a certain spot on the opposite side of the court. So it's not the same thing in terms of the rowing stroke, but that athletic ability to um, line up, you know, a moment in time with the catch and the drive sequence and stuff. I'm sure that helped too. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. I have never really thought of it that way until you said that. Like the because it is. I mean, there's so much timing um, in those those kinds of sp- you know those sports, particularly. Especially, I was a pitcher, <clears throat> and so there's the timing of release. And yeah, that's it. I mean, that is so true. And timing is <laughs> one of the most important things mm-hmm. in rowing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's funny. I've I've never really kind of pinpointed and thought of it in that you know, that, that tunnel, that's an interesting, I'm going to steal that. I'm going to steal that. (laughs) Well, so, well, no, no, that's great. I mean, so the other thing that kind of stands out to kind of build on top of that. So, um, one of the other recent interviews I I did was with Dr. Stuart McGill and we talked a lot about enhancing athleticism in rowers and he's, uh, uh, professor emeritus at this point, but he's one of the top spine biomechanics experts in the world. And so one of the things that he's found through his research was that what the best athletes do, regardless of their sport, doesn't matter what what activity, what discipline, is the best athletes, the high performers, have the ability to uh, contract or pulse very, very quickly, and they can relax 
very quickly. So all those sports you talked about, um, you're, you're initiating contact or you're striking, you're hitting a ball, um, using a bat to swing, um, you're kicking a soccer ball. It's all this moment and you're changing direction. So that ability to generate force, make contact, and then relax, right? Um, you know, you were, you were honing that skill for a very, very long time. So that, I mean, that makes very good sense yeah. to me anyway. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's all, it's all applicable. And that's why when sometimes I hear of, you know, young people, high schoolers and middle, like specializing in rowing at such an early age, it's frustrating. Cause I, I do think that, um, you know, there's so much to be learned and transferred from, from right. Other sports and just other ways to understand and develop your body. Totally. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Um, so kind of building on that. So let's talk about like kind of that, that experience. We talked about like leading up to, to Rio and everything. And it was like, it was just sort of this, you know, evolving thing that was, you, you know, your, your rowing stroke was, was refining as you were gaining more experience and racing more and then getting, going to the Olympics, going, performing in the Olympic final. And then now it's the year after the Olympics, right? So you have kind of, you're, you're more seasoned, you're more mature as a, as a rowing athlete anyway, right? So kind of how do you look back and, you know, is it different now? Is it the same? Like, how, how do you kind of approach things? What's the perspective like? Yeah, I think that, so there was, if I, I wish, there's always that, um, you know, that retrospect, that kind of looking back and wishing you could impart the wisdom that you hold now, the lessons that you felt like you learned through, you know, the pain and mistakes you made, if you could only tell your former self. Um, you know, the post-Olympic year is, is a strange year. Um, I feel like I'm rowing better than I've ever rowed <laughs> right now. And I, it's interesting because, you know, there's so much buildup during the Olympic year and you such a focus on getting everything perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I think everyone is susceptible to that, but I think that, um, you know, perhaps I put so much pressure on, well, this is my one shot thinking like, you know, I've, 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 I've done it. I'm here. I'm close. Um, you know, winning trials was a huge relief. I'd achieved that dream. But even then, knowing the potential that Ellen and I, you know, were, we were capable of, we, we'd won medals at World Cups. We'd made the A final at, at Worlds. We weren't just going to the Olympics to go. We were going to, to medal and to do well. Um, I do think that I perhaps, you know, towed the line of, of putting, um, just thinking that everything had to be perfect. Whereas now this year, I actually feel like this year has been, has been really tough. Like I'm balancing, there's, there's been a lot more, you know, just stuff to you, you take that mental break, but then you're working more. Um, I'm involved with the U S rowing board. My obligations have been much more this past year, which has taken time away from rowing. Um, but in a weird way, perhaps it's forced me to relax a little bit and not take the expectation down, but to understand that like not every day is going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, not every stroke is going to be perfect and I, I can get in my own way. Um, I do think I, you know, put some pressure on myself and that build up into the Olympic year, even to, I could get in my own way. No, not all the time. Obviously we were successful. Um, but this year I, I feel like I have taken a little bit more of a relaxed, like, okay, I understand how to get there. I know what it takes. Um, and I can look back and say, well, that worked and that didn't. And I'm making those adjustments and, you know, it's been, it's been a, it's, you know, it's been a, a weird year with, uh, my partner's been injured and, you know, kind of up and down, but I feel like we're actually, you know, we're doing very, very well. Um, so it's been interesting just to have more the mental approach than anything, um, a little bit, a little bit different. And maybe it's just, you know, part of it is just, again, you, you go through it, you learn that you don't have to be as crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, that's so true. I'm, I'm just, I'm listening to all that and it's, it, it's, it makes me think a lot about the experiences I've had too. And training is, it's never this, uh, linear line. It's like this, somebody took a pen and you put it on a piece of paper and it's this big squiggly thing. Here's the start, here's the finish. And it's not this straight line. It's like all over the place, right? And it ebbs and flows. And, um, so it's great hearing that because like, that's, that's been a lot of my similar experience. And it's so helpful to learn that like, 
in a way, you know, when you're, you're, you're training a lot and there's intensity and volume and you're balancing the other things in life, those ebbs and flows are going to happen. You know, that's quote unquote normal. You know, it's, it's just being able to, uh, to deal with them and roll with them and then, you know, take that and build momentum towards the next thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is, it's like, how well can you navigate the ups and downs? It's never going to be linear. Right. And don't, I mean, that was the biggest, I'm a very passionate person, so I can, I can get really high. I can get really low. And then, you know, rowing has definitely, you don't see the, I mean, that's another, you know, talking, going back to the kind of the, the volleyball, softball, basketball, you, you score a basket that, you know, there's a hundred points scored in a game. Um, and you get that initial feedback of like, yeah, that was good. But in a seven minute race, um, you know, you don't have one, you don't have time to screw up, but two, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you can't, you also can't get upset if I like, Oh, I right. kind of, that stroke was right. bad. Right. So it's, you do have to be in such a different place. And that just that mentality has to expand also to the approach to, to the sport. So just like you said, yeah, like you're going to have bad strokes, you're going to have bad days. Um, and you know, it's so simple and common sense, but it, it's actually, I think it can be really difficult when the stakes are stakes are you know so high absolutely oh yeah for sure do do you do you think that kind of at this point like in your athletic career and in your life like you're it's different in the sense like just listening to some of the things that you shared um you're you're able to kind of you have the experience you you've done you know the training over the last several years you, you're, you're kind of, you, you trust in the process that like, okay, yeah, things are not kind of where I want them at the present, but I know what I need to do and I got to kind of ride this portion out and it, it's going to, it's going to come back around. Yeah. I think that, you know, and that was part of, perhaps it was because of, because of my, you know, rookie kind of novice status. I, I know that I had to spend so many hours, you know, pitching, you know, pitching and batting practice and taking, you know, taking extra balls with a coach on the court. Um, but with rowing, it was, everything was so new. I had nothing. I was like, well, I don't know if this is working. Is this working? Like, are we, <laughs> this is what I need to be doing. Sure. Like, and so it's an interesting, and I think, you know, it, perhaps it just took me a full cycle to understand that, you know, obviously every year you kind of have this build up into worlds and you understand like, Oh, did I get to the place that I wanted to get? Um, but with rowing, you have so few opportunities anyway, especially American scholars and rowers, um, the team, we don't race a lot. And so you have those only few opportunities to test like, well, is this working? Like, am I getting the result I want? Right. And I think that I let myself get caught up in, you know, not having the answers. And so it took me a while to trust in the process and trust that I was doing what I needed to do or, um, you know, this, that it was going to be okay. And having been, you know, been through that enough and kind of hitting my head against the wall a little bit this year, I feel like I have been able to step back and say, you know, this practice or this workout kind of sucked, but it's going to be okay. Like I know that I'm, you know, doing what I need to do. And at the end of the day, like, um, I got it. I kind of understood like it's all part of it instead of that first experience through, I felt like I was, you know, Oh, I'm not doing enough or I'm not doing it right. Um, so it is, I think that, you know, even though I wish I could go back and tell myself, it's almost as if I kind of had to go through it that way. Um, and then to, to kind of have that approach and so much more relaxed, um, because it is, it's just an understanding of, well, this is what it takes. And, you know, um, I feel like I've been able to, to relax and that in turn has, I think I've seen such an improvement in my, um, technical gains because I am actually re <laughs> relaxed yeah. a little bit. So, yeah, that's awesome. That's great. It sounds, yeah. it sounds like, uh, the, the, the crew's poised to have a very good, yeah, regatta I really do well, yeah, just if I, you know, the advice is just chill out, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, For sure. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, is there anything uh, that you kind of like to touch on in terms of just the um, perspective or outlook um, kind of, we'll say up to Rio and then in the last year, how they've differed or other things that you may have learned that you want to share or do, do we hit on everything you think? Yeah. I mean, we, we hit on most of it. You know, I think the a, a big thing that might not be talked about in rowing is uh, all the work we've done, you know, at this level, um, everyone is working hard everyone's got a really good training program and everyone, 
you know, it was, I hate when, I hate when people at this level, not a hate, that's a strong word. I don't agree <laughs> when people <laughs> at this level say, well, we're the hardest working team out there. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure everyone is hard working. Um, are you, you know, are you working with the highest quality? And then are you, you know, are you looking at the other things, the mental approach? Um, Ellen and I, we paid special attention to, we did, you know, a lot of mental training last year, um, with sports, you know, sports psych biofeedback, um, nice. you know, and just kind of understanding that, you know, the gains, obviously you have to be in shape. You have to be technically sound. There are some, you know, there are, there are a lot of gains to be made in the intangibles with, are you mentally strong? Um, how are you getting distracted? And I, I definitely noticed, um, for me through the you know progress of last year, as much as I say, I was, you know, hard on myself and to chill out the mental training we did helped so much with, um, you know, our, just our, our patience and then recovery. You know, if you're not getting so worked up, you're able to, um, force yourself into quicker recovery. And we've carried that into this year of just understanding, um, you know, how, how important it is to be, you know, your work, we work so many hours on our body yeah. and making sure that we're paying attention to our mind, um, and our mental training as well. And I think that that's, that, that's something that not, maybe not everyone, there's a lot more, obviously, you know, studies and information on it now. Um, but I think that that's, that's something that maybe not everyone pays enough attention to that, Ellen and I really, we bought into, and I think it has made a difference. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. The stuff, yeah. the stuff between the ears is pretty important. Yeah. It will take you far. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, could you talk a little bit specifically about, um, like the, the biofeedback and the sports psych? Like, is there, is there special exercises or just things that you went through that you learned in terms of skills that kind of made you develop better awareness as an athlete that you kind of knew were maybe um, checkpoints uh, kind of, if you will, like how your body was feeling and, and you might need to make an adjustment. Yeah, absolutely. So the, a couple of things that we really focused on were, so twice a day with the biofeedback um, work we were doing was we, we did a breathing exercise twice a day and it was 20 minutes. To, so two sessions, so 40 minutes a day, it was one in the morning and then one at night. And we had a particular, I cannot remember the word she used, um, but basically a rhythm that she, you know, our doctor identified uh, with us that was, that, that got our heart into the zone in which we were, you know, we were, we were balanced and in and, and recovery. Um, and so, you know, mine was like, you know, breathing in through my nose for seven seconds and then out through my mouth for five. Um, and, and just the focus on the breath was, you know, within that, then we would start building on exercises, but it was one to, to force us to, um, you know, kind of the understanding and mindfulness of our body, but two, it was to have an exercise, um, and a fallback. So how quickly could we get there? So if we're, you know, we're sitting at the line and we just need to calm down, like taking three breaths. Um, and then it also doing it twice a day really helped with our recovery. And that was something we could actually notice. It was like a 10 week, um, you know, program that we, that we did. And we actually noticed with our recovery, we were, we were sleeping better. We felt a little bit, you know, more energized. Um, for me, I felt just like I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, a, like a higher patience level or tolerance level for frustration. I would get frustrated, but I actually felt, I was like, you know, it's okay. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, it was understanding our body's response to stimuli. So, you know, when we get stressed and, um, going through these exercises, I think there was a physiological effect, but there was also just a tool, right? It's just, mm -hmm. you're, you're building, you know, you're, you're building out your toolbox, um, and having something to fall back on to whether it was to relax yourself or just get into a zone. You know, the reason we did in the morning was to kind of set ourselves up for the day and then in the evening to, to get our body into a, a recovery and rest mode. Um, and then with the, you know, the sports, um, psychology and, you know, work that we were doing was, um, you know, we would have individual sessions, Ellen and myself, and then we would have team sessions. And so it was to, to work through, you know, obviously anything that was bothering us, just like any good therapy, but also just to, again, build out our, our tool set of, 
you know, this is what happens in the final. Why do we feel this way? Or this is what happens when we have a bad practice. And so um, to build out an understanding of our responses, but also to, to you know, equip ourselves with ways to navigate through them. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things that we kind of thought about, again, it's, you know, common sense, but was that mindfulness. So really being in the moment um, and, and not just as a singular moment, but a process of being in the moment. So, you know, as soon as we would start our, you know, waking up the day of the final, um, being very, you know, I'm brushing my teeth. I'm, I can feel the sensation against, you know, my gums. I'm eating my breakfast. I can feel myself chewing. So very, you know, getting in tune with the sensation so that when we got on the water, I feel the blade in the water. I feel the, you know, the bubbles against the, the, the bottom of the boat um, so that you just, you're heightened. Your awareness is heightened um, and your sensations are, are you're, you're fully in tuned. Um, and that's a practice. That's not something you can just like read and, or have someone tell you and you're like, Oh yeah, I got it. (laughs) It's it's something that you have to train your body to get used to in order, you know, just like you can, Oh, well, I saw the perfect stroke take and I can do that. I know you have to do it a lot. Um, and so working, you know, working and making sure that we were again, like spending the time on these other things that outside of our training hours, um, that actually, you know, we, we, we could use to, to go faster. We could actually go faster. And in a sport that's less than seven minute race for us, it, you know, a a split second actually means something. So we got into the Olympic final by five hundredths of a second. (laughs) So that stuff means something. That's great. That's, that's fantastic stuff. Yeah. It's so cool to hear that. Um, that's kind of an area that I've been studying and researching more probably in the last year and a half is definitely on the, not only the recovery side, but the mental side and like the approach yeah. to, you know, what you can do kind of when you're in those tough moments during competition and race, and then also how to develop the, like that awareness that you're talking about. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity, uh, earlier this year to go to a seminar with Mark Allen, who's a six time Ironman world champion. And, I was like really surprised because you would think like, you know, you kick things off. You talk about like, you know, the, the victories, he actually talked about the first six times you lost. Yeah. And, you know, he said that he couldn't, you know, he, he wouldn't have had the success he had if he didn't go through those experiences and he learned valuable lessons, uh, from each of those races. And, um, you know, learning how to, he would, the, the phrase he used was quiet your mind, you know, mm-hmm. when, when you're in that race and this, this thing's like chattering at you, telling you, oh, you know, I could just stop or, you know, pull over and, you know, I've, uh, you know, I'm good. I'm good with what I've done. I'm, I'm content and learning to kind of acknowledge that voice and, you know, put it, put it aside and then continue, continue on in the heat of competition is very difficult and and very much like what you, what you just shared there, everybody's working hard and everybody's training, you know, it's, it's the quality. It's the Mm -hmm. quality. How can we, how can we raise the level of those quality and make those individual strokes and, and squeeze a little bit more speed out of each stroke and stuff. Absolutely. That's awesome. That's really cool stuff. That's great. Um, I can say, Oh, okay. So last thing on training and then we'll kind of shift gears completely to a different topic. So I'd love to hear, um, what do you, what do you do on the strength and conditioning front? So obviously, you know, spending a lot of time on the ergometer, um, in the rowing shell, um, logging a lot of miles, a lot of meters and stuff. Um, but also I'm sure probably getting in some, some S and C work. So I was just kind of curious to, to hear what you do. Yeah. And something I'm lucky that I've always liked weight training. I've always liked lifting. Um, and that is, you you hear different philosophies, especially in the rowing world, um, in terms of, you know, the right kind of lifting or the right kind of program. Um, I I actually, the more I learn, I think it, it's a little bit of, depends on the, you know, the kind of athlete you are and probably maybe the boat you're in. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and male, female, like there's just, when you think about the women's single and the length of time that that race takes versus the the men's eight, you know, it's, 
five thirty or less, and then you're looking closer to seven thirty to eight minutes in conditions. And so those are that's a two minute difference. That's a different physiology sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I think that um, where the sport can grow is is starting to you know identify that well you know, we're doing the same motion, but I think that there are often times. Um, that there can be a little bit different approaches in, 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 you know, emphasizing what that athlete needs to the strength that they need to. And I think, you know, strength and conditioning has been something that Ellen and I have been lucky enough to, um, later in our cycle, uh, focus on a little differently. We had, um, we've had a handful of different coaches, but, um, in the Olympic year, uh, we worked with her name is Sarah Trowbridge and we're still re- working with her this year. Um, and we also started working with, um, his name is Conrad Rapp, but he's got, you know, a background and, um, degree and, uh, I don't even know what his degrees are, but, uh, you know, kinesiology, physiology, and has been writing our, our weightlifting training plan with Sarah who writes our, our training plan. So it's in tandem. It's not just like, here are the weights you should be doing. It's like, oh, you're doing, you know, this many pieces. So we're going to work on this in the weight room. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that having that marriage of understanding of what we're doing on the water to, um, what it means that where we are in our, you know, our lifting cycle, um, is really important and sometimes often overlooked. Um, and so we've in the past year and this year, uh, we've always done, you know, I'll call it the Olympic lifts, power clean, deadlift. Um, you know, those are really the primary ones. Um, with, with where we've gone, you know, bench press, like all the kind of normal, but where we've gone, um, in the, the past couple of years is making sure that, you know, core stability is always so important. We spend a lot of time, um, on sort of, uh, and also, you know, the core stability, but are they, there are exercises that challenge our athleticism, taking it back to what we were talking about earlier, um, sort of eccentric movements. Um, obviously there's, you know, there's, we don't want to get injured, <laughs> but mm-hmm. challenge, challenging our body so that we can, we'll learn, you know, we'll learn something new or engage muscles we're not used to. We spend so much time in the rowing motion that we actually have to work opposite. Um, you know, we, we, other rowers do, some rowers love the bench pull. Um, we never do the bench pull because it's, it's the rowing motion. So we, we try and do something a little, you know, something else, um, you know, that kind of will engage muscles, but is, is activating and balancing us in different ways. Um, what I've really liked is that we do, we've lifted heavier in the past couple of years than we ever have. Um, I think some, you know, some rowers, athletes maybe are scared to lift heavy because of injury, but if you're doing it properly, you're not going to get injured. Um, and we've really, I've noticed, especially we're aging athletes. We're both, I just turned 33 a couple of days ago. We're both 33 you know, power is something that, um, women, and especially as you age, you lose. And so we've really been focusing on power in the weight room. So we do lift heavier, um, and we've, you know, explosive, uh, one of my favorite things we do is like this half, you know, half squat rack lift. Um, and it's, it's, we get really heavy, but it's that last drive. It's kind of mimicking that last hip drive, um, of the stroke. So you, we think about what we're doing in the weight room and how it translates to the water, all the time. And to me, that's, that's been, again, mindfulness, you know, in the deadlift feeling, okay, what am I, you know, how am I feeling at the end? This is sort of like, how am I coming through the stroke? Um, it's yeah, I, I don't know if I can get into the specifics, but again, it's not challenging, challenging us to think about, you know, what we're doing in the weight room to how can we, you know, it's not just to get strong, it's to how can we, better understand, you know, the muscles we're using, um, and the, the motions we're going through that will make us better rowers. Um, and I think that sometimes that's often, perhaps it's overlooked. It's just like, well, you lift because you have to lift also. It's like, no, like, you know, the power clean, like, again, that engagement and then relaxing and letting the bar come up, like, you know, Mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, you're driving and then you kind of have to let the blade go. And so making sure you're, well, why am I doing this motion? Like, why does it make sense? And translating that into be, you know, being a better athlete on the water, Mm -hmm. um, it's so important. And I think that I, I think both Ellen and I have seen gains with how we've been approaching the importance and the emphasis that we've, we've put on our strength and conditioning, um, in the past couple of years. Fantastic. I love it. I love it. I can hear, I can just listening. I can, the, uh, the attention to detail and the mindfulness in your movement has been translated to the rowing stroke. 
Yeah. I mean, it's so important. Again, just like taking it back to, you know, it's in the details. Like if you want to get that much better, you have to be thinking about every kettlebell swing. Like, am I feeling it? Am I doing this right? Am I, not, I can't just be going through the motions. Like Ellen and I have the same warm up that we do for weights and we've done it a hundred times probably, but we have to have the same focus that we had on the first day we did this warm up to, you know, doing it yesterday. So mm-hmm. it's, um, otherwise, you know, what are you doing it for? And that's, I think that's, again, that's the challenge, but I think that that's what separates the, you know, recreational from the, do you want to, like, do you want to perform? Do you want to, do you want to win? <laughs> so it's that's, little things like that. That's right. Mastering the basics. The fundamentals. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before we kind of shift gears to, uh, like Instavisor and you as well? No, let's do it. Cool. Yeah. Um, so why, first off, why don't we just start with what is Instavisor for those not familiar and, um, kind of, uh, share with the audience, you know, who the company is and what they do. And then also then your, your role there. Cool. So Instavisor, I N S T A V I S E R. <laughs> um, Instavisor is, it was, it's a company It was co-founded by two Olympians, uh, Pete Chipalone, who's an Olympic champion rower. He was in the 2000 to 2004, um, men's, so there's a 2004 champion men's, uh, men's eight. Um, and he co-founded this company with a speed skater, Tommy O'Hare. Um, and they, they began first Instavisor began as a, uh, you know, platform to connect basically the lay person. So, you know, maybe it's a, a master's athlete, recreational athlete, or, um, a young, a young athlete aspiring, you know, aspiring to become an Olympian or a professional baseball player with elite athletes and elite coaches. So it's all, it was all done, you know, on a virtual platform. So it's a website you could go find, you know, I want to talk to Megan O'Leary. She's an Olympic rower. Um, and you could schedule a session with me and it was all done via the platform video or phone. Um, and you know, you pay whatever the, the athlete had kind of said, this is my, this is my, this is my rate. Um, and so that was sort of our, our beta as, as understanding the technology and will people behave in this way? And then we made a pivot, um, a couple years ago, about two and a half, close to three years ago, I guess, to creating, um, using this technology, but creating, creating platforms for, you know, private organizations, universities, uh, nonprofits that, that do just this. So basically it was coaching. It was taking your athletic background, and providing, you know, virtual coaching. And now it's creating, it's this technology, but creating a platform for mentorship, um, you know, coaching, coaching, uh, which is basically a form of mentorship and professional networking. So, you know, we have clients that range from everywhere from, you know, the United States Olympic Committee to the University of California um, to a handful of nonprofits. And what we do is just, you know, we're enabling, enabling kind of this, this new world of mentorship and connectivity um, where it's, it's so important now that, you know, finding, finding the answers for the questions you have, whether it's professionally, um, or, you know, gosh, I'm an athlete and I'm going to, you know, this is my last year competing and I need to get a job and I've been competing for 10 years. I don't have any quote unquote work experience, but I have all these skills. And so it would be wonderful if I could talk to someone who's been in my shoes, but is now the senior vice president, um, with visa. (laughs) <laughs> and, wow. you know, and that's what we're, you know, we've created is, is a, it's basically, you know, when you think about all the networks out there, there's LinkedIn, there's Facebook, but this is actually bringing it a step further and creating, you know, these private networks for people based on their, you know, their affinities. I'm an athlete, I'm a, you know, Olympian, I have um, this, this access to this, it's called the ACE Mentor Network that I can connect with, you know, former athletes and Olympians who've gone on and have successful careers. And so I'm networking, I'm learning from people who understand what it's like to be in my shoes. Um, and the importance of that in today's world is, I think is huge. Um, and so, yeah, it's really cool because it marries, um, you know, we're, we're athletes, we're, we're mostly athletes that, that work Mm -hmm. at the company. Um, so the understanding of, you know, we all have, have seen success, but we all know that someone helped us get there. And Mm -hmm. so providing a platform and a way for people to, you know, have, have access to that, you know, that lifelong learning and kind of, you know, avenue of, of being able to find the answers to help, um, get me where I get is really, it's really rewarding and fulfilling. And so, yeah, it's been really neat. 
to be a part of that um, over the past few years while I've still been training. Um, my role, I'm vice president of customer success. And so I'm, I work with all of our customers and accounts um, in building out the platforms and making sure they stay happy and, um, you know, do some business development, so sales and finding new customers. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's a really cool company to be with. Yeah, it sounds fun. Yeah, cool. no, it's, it's really cool. So That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. A lot of relationship building and meeting new people. Yeah, you know, and that's what, I mean, in today's world, <laughs> everyone's on their phone or computer. <laughs> um, and so, you know, but it doesn't mean that we can't have, have great, you know, valuable personal connections. Um, totally. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then uh, shifting gears, so what's, what's the role uh, a little bit more in depth at, with the U.S. Rowing Board? So I've been on the board, this is my fourth year of my first term. Um, my official title is that, you know, I'm the female athlete rep. So I was voted on by my peers to you know, represent the athlete con contingency um, on the board. Um, this past year, we've, we've had, you know, just a lot happen um, at U.S. Rowing. As any NGB will go through um, in a post, you know, kind of following Olympics, there's an assessment and there's mm -hmm. um, a period of change and growth. We just hired a new CEO. Um, at the early, you know, the, the turn of the year in January, uh, we had a few, um, board members, um, step down, resign, and I was named interim chair. So interim president of the board, um, which is, I, I'm not sure there's ever been a, um, an active training athlete that was ever a chair of an NGB. Oh, wow. uh, and so it was, it was very challenging. Um, and I, I carried the interim through our next elections, which was mid March. Um, so I'm no longer chair, which is, um, it was a, you know, a, a learning experience for a few months. And then I was, I was happy to pass the baton as I needed to refocus on training. Um, but it, you know, it's, I, I ran, um, four years ago, um, to, to serve. I've always thought that, you know, giving back and, and being a part of, being a part of something that is kind of bigger than yourself was important. And I knew that, um, I knew that I wanted to, to, you know, that's always been a part of who I am. And I knew that this was a, the, a way to do that. And so, um, it's been really interesting. This is my first, you know, board that I, well, yeah, first, you know, NGB board, um, that I've been a part of and I've learned a lot, but it's been, you know, a, fun to, as an athlete, obviously to represent the athlete interests, but when you're on the board, you're, you know, you're responsible for the organization's health and growth. Mm -hmm. Um, and so understanding, and, and I think I, I bring a little outsider's perspective where I haven't been in the sport since I, you know, was very young. And so I can see things a little differently and, um, bringing a different level of understanding perspective and asking questions. Um, so it's, but yeah, it's been, you know, it's been, an interesting, but, um, good experience. I've learned a lot and, um, you know, in my way of, of serving, kind of giving back to the sport and being a part of something bigger than, you know, obviously my own personal pursuit. Right on. That's great. That's yeah. Great. Very cool. Just try, trying to make it better for the ones that come after me. <laughs> That's it. It's so. all, it's all about giving back. Right. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, is there anything else that you want to touch on before we head to the rapid fire? Oh man, I don't know. Do I want to avoid the rapid fire or is this? <laughs> no, no, no. It's fun. It's, it's nothing. Uh, this isn't like, um, Jim Rome's like, uh, you're on the hot seat or anything <laughs> yeah. like that. So yeah, no, uh, I think we've covered a lot. This yeah, it's been good. Cool. Um, all right. So first question. So Megan, uh, given all of your knowledge uh, and experience that you've accumulated at this point in your life, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Play golf. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Pick a sport that you can make money off of. No, I'm kidding. Um, 10 years ago, how old would I have been? So I'm 22. I'm in my grad year at UVA. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe <sighs> chill out. You know, I said that earlier. Um, and I think that, I think that so much can be gained from relaxing and taking a step back. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, 
you know, I, I look back and I, I've had such a, it's been such an interesting 10 years. Um, but I, I don't, I wouldn't have wanted, you know, don't change it. Cause I think that I had an opportunity to row in my fifth year. Um, so I, I had five years of athletic eligibility for in one sport, obviously. And I did volleyball and softball. Um, and I had an opportunity to row and people were like, well, how cool would it have been to, to row in college too? Um, like, you know, I, I don't think so. Like then I wouldn't have had this, this mm-hmm. kind of crazy experience and hunger for what I did. So, um, I wouldn't have you know wanted to change that, but I think that, um, much can be gained from just relaxing a little bit more. <laughs> right on. Right on. Very cool. Um, if you had to pick one, what's your favorite strength training exercise? Man. Well, I kind of alluded to it earlier and it's a, it's a newer one. So we do this, our coach calls it the, it's like the half, half back squat rack. So we set the bar, um, the crossbars up about, um, sports bra line for us, mm-hmm. the chest. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a half squat and we get heavy and it's a really explosive, just driving through. Um, and it's fun because I can see the bar bending over my shoulders cause it's really heavy <laughs> and you feel really strong. Um, but two, it's, you know, I've always liked the explosive movements and feeling powerful and feeling quick. Um, that, that is one of my favorite, uh, exercises that we do right now. Awesome. Uh, how has your training changed today compared to 10 years ago? Oh, well, I definitely much, <laughs> much I sleep more. <laughs> Sleep's um, awesome. Sleep's yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think that, yeah, if I, you know, going back on that advice, I probably would tell myself to relax a little more and sleep a lot more. Um, I did not sleep a lot in college, so I think that I would definitely tell myself to get a few more hours of uh, Z's. Um, but, you know, how that segues into, right, how, how I train, just to focus on um, the importance of, you know, I think when you're young, you think you're invincible, or at least I did. <laughs> and um, you, you don't realize how good you can feel until you feel that good. And I think that, you know, training now is much more than the hours that I put on the water. It's what I'm eating, what I'm drinking, yeah, what I'm sleeping, when I'm eating, um, when I'm drinking, when I'm, you know, sleeping. It's, there's so much more to training than just working out. Um, and I think that, you know, I didn't, I didn't have that approach 10 years ago. And I think that I could have probably, you know, been a much better athlete had I known that. And obviously the science has come a long way and the, the understanding of the body, but, um, you know, realizing that my, you know, what I can get out of my body is so much more, but I got to treat it, you know, I got to treat it a lot better as well. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I've, uh, I've had the same lessons myself <laughs> and, it's, yeah. and sometimes it just takes, just the experience and getting a little bit older and being like, yeah, I just don't bounce back like I used to. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, have you ever had an injury? And if so, how did that affect your training? Yeah. When I first started rowing, I think I've had three broken ribs. Um, and knock on wood, I haven't. Um, part of that is just the body getting used to the load. Um, part of it was technical. Um, breaking a rib is a common thing, especially with women. Just, um, I think it's, you know, I'm not a doctor or physical therapist, but it's sort of how we're built, but, um, the load and it's something that unfortunately is, like I said, common, um, especially at the elite level. And it is the, one of the most painful things (laughs) like Mm -hmm. breathing, laughing, sneezing, sleeping. Um, and it really, it was tough and to, to go through it a few times, Um, but I think it also forced me again, going back to, I didn't, you know, I was working a lot more when I was breaking my ribs. So I was like hunched over my computer. I wasn't sleeping as much. I wasn't eating enough protein. Um, and you know, it forced me to understand like, Oh wait, there's so much more that I have to be thinking about because I'm training at such a higher level than I ever have before. I'm getting older. Um, and you know, now my body's breaking down. Like, how do I, you know, what are the defense mechanisms? How do I, how do I kind of, you know, create, how do I be more proactive about making sure this doesn't happen? So it as painful and as frustrating as it was, um, you know, it forced me to, to look at the, the train, you know, again, training as a holistic experience and the battle through, I mean, injury is depressing. (laughs) It is depressing. Mm -hmm. You're watching your teammates and, they're, they're getting to, you know, continue to train and you're having to either sit on the bike or not train at all. And 
not only are you not, you know, getting the endorphins of working out, you're, you're feeling left behind. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is, there is, you know, there's some mental, um, struggles and challenges that you have to go through, but it also, I think it does make you a better athlete. Um, you know, and I think that it's, I don't want to do it again, (laughs) but you know, it's something that having gone through it, I think it made me a better athlete. And I've had several surgeries before that college, like knee surgeries. Oh my gosh. (laughs) But I would say broken ribs are the worst. (laughs) Yeah. I've, I've had a couple episodes with the ribs and they suck. Yeah. Especially the sneezing, laughing, uh, (laughs) sleeping. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't think people appreciate how painful it is because the thing is you don't stop breathing. So your rib cage is always moving. Where it's yeah. not like you break your arm, it's like put it in a cast and it's isolated for eight weeks. You know, it you stop breathing, you're dead. <laughs> so your, yep. rib, your rib cage is always expanding and contracting and it's, it's, um, there's, it's not even, there's, it's not even a lot of bone really. It's more, there's more cartilage and musculature around it. It's a very, it's more like a spring yeah. than, uh, than, than bone. It's, it's very unique sort of structure in the body in that regard. So, but I'm, I'm stoked to hear that you're kicking butt, happy and healthy. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, okay. What's one thing that high school athletes, um, of any sport should be doing more of to complement their training and their health? Sleep, sleep. I think that especially as a young person, you know, like I'd said, you kind of think you're invincible. It's not a bad thing. I thought so too. And it's the joy of being young is you, you know, you think and you should think you can do anything, but the importance of sleep, um, you know, sleep and eating, like eating right, eating well, um, just, it, it's not only for, you know, that current state of wanting to perform well and feel good. Um, what, what you're doing now actually has an impact on, you know, 10 years from now, how your body is going to be, you know, what kind of shape you're going to be in. Um, and I think, you know, sleeping is, such uh is you can't, you know you can't get enough <laughs> as an athlete um especially you know the rowing and the hours and the just the the strain that you're putting your, yourself through um you know recovery you recover best when you're when you're sleeping so yes young people sleep <laughs> yeah um what's your best tip to improve recovery it might be the same answer yeah i mean definitely right sleep rest um and then you know the eating and drinking component. Um, one thing I failed to mention earlier was that Ellen and I did an intolerance testing. So food, mm-hmm. um, not allergy, but that intolerance. So like the leaky gut syndrome, but also just what kind of reactions do we have to certain foods? Um, I was fortunate enough. I don't have a lot of things, but I could at least, you know, understand how my body responds to eggs, milk, you know, kind of the, the normal ones. Um, Ellen, on the other hand, um, had, you know, a lot more things that she had to, be aware of. And she saw such a change in her health. She was getting sick less. She was getting injured less, um, just by changing her diet. And it wasn't anything dramatic. Um, I mean, it was, you know, it's like big changes, but nothing that it's not like she's uncomfortable about what she has to eat. Like she can have, um, and I think that, you know, that is something that, um, makes a lot of sense. Like, Oh, what we're putting into our body, but, Um, you know, our bodies are all unique and and getting, you know, an understanding of what you need to perform at a high level, um, takes some time and it also takes some, um, kind of analysis. So I think that that is something that, um, has been beneficial in how we've also been able to make more gains is just, you know, being a lot more cognizant of what we're putting into our body, but also what our body needs, because what you need is not the same as what I need. Right. Um, And so I think that that, you know, that's a, that's a big thing that can aid recovery. Um, because if you're eating a whole bunch of like heavy meats or, you know, something that your body can't quite digest, well, you're actually, your body is having to spend time digesting and you're not recovering. And so understanding, you know, kind of what your body needs and and what you should be eating, um, will help in that process. Love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, three more, but these are all fun. Uh, what's your favorite meal? Ooh. Okay. So I'm a sucker for, um, you know, anything like Mediterranean halal, uh, like clean. So, I mean, I love Greek food, um, like the Lebanese kind of anything that's like, Oh, so you like tabbouleh, middle Eastern tabbouleh. Um, 
I love uh, a good, like a good, you know, whether it's gyro and there's like the lamb and beef. So I don't do, I can't do a lot of it. Um, but, you know, hummus, baba ganoush, I, that is my, if I, falafel, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that if I could, you know, eat, eat, if I had to eat one, you know, one thing for the rest of my life and then baklava, like I got to have a sweet treat. So, yeah, I, I that's my, I nice. love yeah, give me a good give me a good Mediterranean Greek plate and I'll be happy. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> um what's one book everyone should read? Ooh. Oh, I have so many. One book everyone should read. <laughs> oh my goodness. I want to I want to shamelessly promote a friend's book, but I haven't finished it so I can't quite do that. Oh gosh. I knew you're going to ask me something like this and my mind just goes blank. Um, see, this is tough because I go from everything from like, I read like, you know, memoir, bio, like nonfiction to, you know, like the book I'm reading now, I'll tell you what I'm reading now is, um, called lying to children. Okay. It's by Alex Shala. And it's actually funny. It's like a funny book. Um, but when you're on the road, we do, we read a lot. Um, Oh man, I'm not going to be able to give you a good one. I'm actually thinking of a book and I can't quite think of the title. Um, it's an older book and someone gave it to me. Shoot. I wish we could edit this one, this question out. <laughs> That's all right. It's okay. Uh, I'll think of it. Ask me, ask me the next question and I'll think of okay. this book. I see the title. It's got like Atlas on it and it's a, it's like a sports, um, is it like town is overrated by Jeffrey Colvin. Oh, I've read that, but no. Um, um, or stronger, better, faster, or no, no, no. Oh shoot, I'm gonna look it up. Okay. In the meantime, the last question is: Who have you studied, or do you do you continue to study in your career to improve and get better? So, who do you learn from? Who are the people you learn from? I would say that it's interesting. That's a good question because I don't. Um, I don't just watch one person. I mean, there's definitely, I have favorites that I like to watch because so much of rowing is like finding your stroke. Um, and you know, everyone's built differently. And so they're going to move the the boat differently. And I think that oftentimes you see, you know, Kim Crow, um, now Kim Brennan, uh, Australian single scholar, you know, gold, gold medal champion and Rio silver medalist, um, in London. And she's in, an incredible athlete. But she is, I am not built like her. <laughs> and I will never be, I will never move the boat like she moves the boat. Uh, and so, you know, for all of last cycle, a lot of coaches were saying like, oh, you know, look at Kim Crow rowing, which is absolutely like she has sort of the perfect like by the book um, stroke. But she's, she's also built that built, you know, she's physiologically gifted and built in a way that um, supports that stroke to be mm -hmm. successful. Um, and I think that identifying, you know, understanding that as a rower and understanding that, you know, I'm not going to look like everyone, um, but finding, you know, someone who's moving the boat well successfully that perhaps you kind of, you look like, um, I really like watching Robbie Manson. He's Australian men's single and new world world's best time holder, world's best time record holder. Um, he was in the double last year and Ellen and I used to actually watch, like, look at their double a little bit cause they're they're a little bit body double. Like she's, she looks similar to his former double partner. Um, but I, I do like watching him row and it's not about the full stroke, but it's like, well, look how he's taking the water and look how he, mm -hmm. you know, he comes through. Um, we, we would watch, I remember last year a lot, we would actually watch the, um, the gold medal, the light women's double, which was the, the, the British light women's double in 2012. Um, they, we liked watching them a lot. So it's identifying, um, I think you have to have like a notebook, like a plethora of athletes, actually. Like, I don't think you should just watch one athlete because there are so many ways, um, to move a boat. And if you can, you know, as you learn and as you, you know, pick pinpoint, you know, everyone does things a little differently, but you can also, you know, pick up on, well, they, I like the way they take the water and that, that feels like something that I can do. Um, and so I, I definitely, I like to watch different people. Um, and then, I mean, I always have my favorites, like a Katarina Karsten is epic. <laughs> She's mm -hmm. legendary. Yeah. 
she, you know, just what she's doing, um, not only in her entirety of the time with the sport, but, um, you know, she's just fun to watch. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would just say that i definitely have a handful of people that you just sort of, you, you gravitate toward finding. I loved watching Emma Twig in the single. I actually found her approach toward the stroke a lot more how I wanted to. If you watched her, she was a little bit more link, like kind of gangly, like moved, fluid. She was like crooked. Um, but <laughs> she it was sort of an athletic, relaxed stroke. Um, she's not that big. Uh, you know, she's not 6'3". She's like barely six foot. Um, and so, you know, for me, I'm barely six foot and finding someone who I feel like, well, that kind of looks like how I can move. I can be successful like that. Um, I think is important because if you're constantly looking at LeBron James and you're like, well, I just got to move like him. Like how many people are LeBron James size, you know? Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, maybe you look a little bit more like Steph Curry, but look, he's successful. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's, it's identifying the traits that, that your, you know, your attributes and your qualities, um, and then finding, you know, finding someone who's doing them at a very high level that, that maybe, you know, you can, you can aspire because your, your attributes and qualities are similar to, to how they're utilizing theirs. So. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. did you remember your book? <sighs> no, I haven't had time. And I right. really, we didn't talk about the TEDx. Um, oh yeah. If you wanted to, we don't no, have no, to. No, no, no. If you have time, um, you know, I don't want to take away from recovery. Um, but yeah, we, we, so to, to give the audience background, you gave this wonderful, uh, TEDx, uh, talk on kind of the theme was, um, that the one thing that we all share is this day, the, you know, our one day. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll let you take it from there. It's, it's yeah. Your <laughs> no, I don't know if you had a, in a, you know, I did uh, forget that one. Sorry about that. Oh, absolutely. So in pursuit, sorry, I just remembered. In pursuit of excellence, I think oh, is the nice. book. Cool. Have you? I don't know if you've read that, um, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. It's a little sciencey uh, sometimes because it talks about, but it goes through as an athlete. Um, it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a good one. I'll check it anyway, out. Yeah, uh, Terry Orlick. So it's okay. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's all about like the kind of gaining the competitive edge and um, both on the physical, mental side. So a lot of stuff we talked about, but mm -hmm. um, he pulls in, he, he studies a lot, like a lot of athletes, like high level athletes. And so it's a good one in pursuit of excellence. I was going to say something about uncompromised excellence. I was like, no, that doesn't sound right. But in pursuit, <laughs> um, cool. but right. No, the TEDx was a great experience. It was right. The, the theme, um, you know, every day counts. The power of one day was the title of the talk. Um, and every day counts sort of became my mantra, uh, leading into, you know, leading into the, the Olympics. Um, partly because I, my first coach was he, this, he's from Germany, Gunter, um, Gunter is a big Gunter Butter. He's a big name in rowing. Um, but he was, he's in a, there's a club up in Connecticut. Um, it's called GMS, but I got on his plan and I just remember talking to him one day and I was frustrated and I kind of just, you know, it hit me like, I don't have to go to the Olympics tomorrow, but I got to figure out how, like how, if I want to get there, like how I'm going to, you know, how I'm going to get there. And, you know, just was kind of talking with them. I think we were actually having like a beer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I got to get a little bit better every day. Right. I just got to yeah. do something that gets me a little bit better. And he, you know, he's just, he kind of, he said it in German and it's this besser yet and talk and it's like better every day. And, um, and that just evolved into, it's such an easy and simple mindset and it's not a new idea, but I think it's, especially in this day and age where you can get anything you want right away, um, that doesn't translate to success or performance. Um, and you have to, you have to be able to take that kind of that very basics, like you said, you know, the doing, doing the basic movements right. Um, and doing, you know, every day, like being able to approach and say, I don't have to do something fantastic and great today, but I got to at least do something that's going to put me closer to doing that, you know, a week, a month, a year from now. Um, and so it just evolved, uh, for me and that in my talk, I just kind of, you know, I picked out a few anecdotes, um, and sort of, you know, in the days that added up to, to Rio, um, from my, you know, my first day of ever picking up an oar to sitting at the Olympic final, um, and just having that perspective of looking back and realizing, you know, there were some very, crucial days that were turning points. Um, and they didn't seem like it at the time maybe, but they ended up being so important and we don't have that luxury of knowing when we're 
I mean, oftentimes, you know, when you're, you know, you're in a moment, but, you know, so often we don't know how important some of the mundane really becomes. Um, But if you can have that perspective of like, no, this matters, then you, then you don't miss those opportunities. And that's really what it was about. Um, And it was a blast. Like I had so much fun. It was, it was kind of like having a, a competition during the talk and I had an adrenaline rush and was so nervous. And then afterwards was exhausted. So it was like a, a training or a race. <laughs> yeah. Me. Oh man. Yeah. He came down off of the, uh, the endorphins. Yeah. Very oh. cool. No, I really enjoyed it. That was a great speech you gave. Very good. So cool. I'll make, I'll make sure to include, um, uh, a link to it in the show notes. Okay. Right? Yeah. No, awesome. thanks. So yeah. you did the rapid fire and you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're like totally off the hook now. So yeah. Great. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed, um, you know, sitting down and speaking with you and getting to know you a little bit more and your journey and experiences and stuff. Um, it's been awesome. So uh, let, me, let me just give you a proper goodbye off air. Yeah, this is this is fun. This is good. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. It was fun talking with you, Joe. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.